Hello and welcome to this mini lecture on the Frankfurt School of Popular Culture Part 2. And in this mini lecture we're just going to take a look at a few examples to better define or, or make sense of. Uh, as you can see the image I have up here is of course of the various iPods and just that idea of uh, standardization, right? This has become our standard for music listening and pseudo-individualization. You can have all these different types of potential iPod, iPods. You know, your iPhone, your all these different ones, but they all do the same thing. And yet, I've certainly known a fair share of pre people, myself included, at one time or another, that have ended up with more than one iPod. Um, and so the qu that raises that interesting question of why are we spending, you know, our money and our attention on getting more of the same things? But we're going to take a look at coffee, as we've looked at coffee before in this class, and try to kind of get a sense of how all of this works within, at least within the Frankfurt uh, School critique of popular culture. So we get up in the morning, and many of us, though not all of us, have our morning coffee and we have that coffee so that we can function right whether we're going to Dunkin's or to Starbucks or just making our coffee at home or when we get to work using the Carrick machine we are all drinking lots of coffee so that we can function and we need to function because most of us are going to work even school is a form of work right so we get a, our coffee so that we can function so that we can get to work and of course we work so that we can afford entertainment Right? I say this, many of us certainly work just to cover ends meet, but the goal of working, of education, all of that, is to work only so much and then to afford your entertainment. Right, then to afford then to afford your tickets to the show, to your you know, the new ginormous screen T V that you got, the new gaming system, um, an upgrade on your cell phone, a new car, right? So we do all of these things. A new car when you don't necessarily need one. So, right, we get our coffee in order to function, we function in order to work, we work well beyond what we need to in order to get our entertainment. And our entertainment often consumes us enough so that we don't sufficiently rest and so therefore we lack rest so when we get up in the morning we need that coffee in order to function in order to work in order to have our entertainment which produces a lack of rest right so these are this you know through the Frankfurt School this would be seen as that distraction cycle that the ways in which we create distractions to actually avoid engage, engaging fully in the world around us. It keeps us focused to a limit of limited things that are produced by the culture industry. So the culture industry gives us choices but of degree, right? That's that pseudo individualization, right? Yes, we have choices, right? But they have really uh, only of a certain degree. They're not really categorical choices, right? So ultimately, we can have any type of iPad, uh, you know, any type of iPod we want, but they really all essentially do the same thing or the the difference isn't spectacular. And we're limited, right? So I, you know, I, I keep talking about iPads and iPods because I think these are a good example or a good discussion point that we're all familiar with. But you know, we're limited with what we can do. You know, we get we purchase music now even less so than with CDs, and it's limited what we can do. If I buy music, I can't share that per se with my friends, even though I somehow own it, right? So when we get into intellectual properties and the limitations and restrictions on them. Uh, we increasingly see this pseudo-individualization take place. And then the big thing to, to remember with this is that the profits will determine the cultural, uh, the cultural forms and that, that such things within popular culture privilege profits, or, or profit is privileged. Um, if it makes money, then it sticks, regardless of whether it's important or not. And also embedded within that, embedded with this profits to earn in cultural forms is that you start to see the rise of planned obsolescence, right? You don't, y in through the culture industry point of view, you don't create things that are permanent. The goal is to keep people buying and, and investing in that pseudo indi indivi individualization, so you don't actually allow for 
sustained forms. So a good example of that is, of course, disposable razors. Disposable razors, of course, mean you have to keep buying razors. Um, you're continually buying new ones. And if you look at something like uh, Gillette in their Mach series, right? That's M-A-C-K, uh, M-A-C-H, their Mach, as in like fast. Right, they have, you know, they have the Mach 3 and the Mach 3 Hyper and the Mach 4, and you know, it's it's all of this is, of course, pitching somehow a new and improved when it's really not that new, not that improved. And of course, disposable razors are only supposed to last a certain period of time. You're not buying a permanent razor that you could use forever. You have to buy something that needs replacing. Right, so that's planned obsolescence. That's that's worked into. If you think about whenever you buy a product now, particularly from a place like Best Buy and the like, you're offered a service plan. And you have to raise that question, if I'm buying a, a product of quality, why do I need a service plan for a year? I would think whatever I would buy, if that's an electronic gadget, should last more than a year. But that's planned obsolescence. That's attempting to offer you know, a product that is going to have a purposeful not accidental, a purposeful, you know, we only want these items to last so long. Um, so again, that's part of the culture industry creating pseudo needs, creating pseudo individualization, and creating um, reasons for you to go out and buy again. So we've talked in these two lectures about critical theory and, and the Frankfurt School and the ideas that they offer up. and. You know, they, they are one means or historically one way of approaching and looking at, cr at popular culture. But there are some challenges to them that are worth acknowledging and talking about before anybody goes head over heels and thinks this is, you know, oh, this is how we should look at popular culture. We should, but we should remember these critiques, these critiques of critical theory and have them in the back of our heads whenever we're using them. The first is that it produces on mass production, not individual creators. Right, so uh, critical theory I is talking about the mass production of things, but doesn't actually give privilege to individuals, and that's uh, ins that is problematic in so much as we d have seen historically how individual creators have changed or influenced um, what happens. You know, everything. From, you know, you could talk about the Beatles. You could talk about. Um, Nirvana, you know, you can look at individuals and how they change what goes on. Um, and I think that that's an important missing piece, that it just talks about the product and not the, the people behind it or the people invested in it. Uh, and it doesn't distinguish between functional artifacts and textual artifacts, right? And so what I mean by this, a functional artifact are purpose-based products, right? Whether that's your car, whether that's a, you know, uh, whether that's a mop, whether that's things that are there to serve some purpose, versus textual artifacts, which are content-based. That is, the stories on, you know, the stories in a book or in a film or the actual, you know, the ideas in these things. And they, in the failure to distinguish between those two things I think is important because, uh, or, or it's, it's certainly problematic because of the ways in which uh, the ideas embedded in certain in certain texts, be they film, book, uh, radio, what have you, are just as as important within popular culture, uh, not just the actual physical objects or um, the the kind of shell to which we put those ideas into. It lacks empirical empirical evidence. That is not, you know, there, there's been no actual study of this or no way of actually pulling this together um, to prove it. It just says this is out there, and you'll find a lot, of, you know, a lot of the theories that we look at that lacks empirical evidence. Uh, they're based on strong intellectual analysis, but no real follow through. So it's hard to say, oh, that's definitely true. Uh, again, it. It's still an elite stance on popular culture, very much like mass culture theory. Um, you know, when it talks about true needs, you know, when it talks about things that are really important, those are still often grounded in elite tastes. And so there is still this, this disregard for popular culture that uh, makes it, you know, that makes it questionable, that raises a question about how, you know, if you're judging something from the get-go or, or believing there's, you know, 
you're wanting to remove this in, in lieu of that, th that does raise some questions. Um, and it, create a it, it criticizes standardization while at the same time creating its own, right? So critical theory says, oh, that standardization of, of the culture industry is bad. But by offering up a theory, offering up a way in which you, you know, say this is how you view the world, you're offering your own standardization. So the question raises, well, what makes yours better? Or how can you, you know, throw this standardization out at the behest of your own view on standardization? And it, it, it says that capitalism is stable, and as we've looked at the last, you know, you know the, the um, economic disaster of the late 2000s, and, you know, that we're still here in 2014 stealing, feeling the repercussions from, uh, it's kind of hard to say that capitalism is entirely stable. It isn't, and we, we've seen the impacts from that in a variety of ways. And it can't explain culture industry failures. I have the film Waterworld up there from the 1990s. Um, people probably, uh, if, if you're not old enough, aren't familiar with this movie, but it's basically a good example of million, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars pumped into a film that flopped. Now, if the culture industry what the, is what the, the Frankfurt School says it is, the every everything they invest in should be a hit and yet there are plenty of flops there are plenty of movies and CDs and books that just go right down the drain so that's one of the reasons why we're questionable about critical theory in, in the Frankfurt School is that there's you know it implies that they should know what they're doing and that there should never be failures and yet there are lots of failures within uh, within things produced by the culture industry and then it also infantile infantile adults. That is, it limits, you know, their agency, their intelligence. It set, it kind of promotes or refers them or represents them as child or as children, as babies, as people who are completely and easily manipulated and just continually need or, you know, have this incessant need, need, need. Uh, and I don't know that I'm entirely comfortable with that, um, seeing as how I like to think of myself as an adult. And then they also fail to give us a sense or clear distinction of what's a false need and what's a real need. Who gets to decide that? How is that decided? What do we mean by real needs? Is real needs simply, you know, enough food to survive day to day and enough shelter so that you're not doing harm to yourself? Um, you know, what is a real need versus a false need in, in a culture, among a people? It doesn't ever really give us a clear sense of that. And then, of course, no clear idea of what fulfillment of real needs would look like. What would it look like for somebody to be fulfilled, to have their real needs met? Um, can we, you know, what is that image? There's no way to actually substantially embody that. And then, finally, another quote from Dominic Stranati. In this picture, true needs are seen as abstract, ahistorical, and utopian aspects of human nature, and yet always have to be achieved in specific historical and social circumstances. This means that the attempt to distinguish between false and true needs in a way which has empirical relevance is never considered. How can needs be defined without reference to their social definition, historical transformation, and practical fulfillment or non-fulfillment? So again, here's that idea of, you know, there, there's this utopic view of what that true needs is, but you can't, you know, that this abstract idea needs actual concrete manifestation in the world that we live. It can't just be an idea of what it should be. We need a, an exact understanding of how it can be in the world that we offer. All right, that's all for now. Thank you very much for listening, and see you in the next video.